Hi, hello, welcome to the episode of Isaiah's Newsstand. It's your host, Isaiah Edwards. The date is February the 24th, 2024. Hope this episode finds you well in good spirits and high hopes. As for me, I'm doing pretty good. I will say I'm pretty sleepy. I uh, didn't sleep too great and I uh, have a bit of a potentially busy day-ish. So figured, hey, let me just go ahead and, you know, get my little talk session in with y'all. Talk about some news, yap it up a little bit, you know. So I figured I'd do that now. Um, maybe get a nap in or something. That'd be great. Perfect. So, you know, wish me luck for that. But yeah, um, hopefully, you know, this finds you, you know, in a good sp- good space, good place on a Saturday, you know, or when, whenever you're listening to it. Uh, it's it's a bit cold, a bit nippy again. Snow's come back out. But um, hopefully this isn't like a, you know, uh, a constant winter. You know, hopefully we're going to be doing that early spring. I know that that what is it, Puxatani Phil, he saw a shadow, right, so, you know, I, sh- I should have covered that, I should know. I should be knowing these things, I should be telling y'all, anyway, um, let's see, oh, Food Corner, yeah, that's a, that's the thing we talk about on this podcast, the things that I've eaten, uh, this was a usual, I had um, the Korean fried chicken, the spicy version this time, with uh, the rice, I will say, since we had the, you know, the, bur- the burrito, um, shells. I finally did a little fusion, if you will. And uh, I mean, I've technically done this with tacos, so I, it's not the first time. But um, I, I rolled up a little burrito out of the chicken and the rice and had that as well. And then I had um, two egg rolls. So there you go. Ate pretty good last night. But yeah, sadly, no pizza Friday. We broke the streak. Oh, uh, but you know, I'm sure there will be pizza in the near future. You know, that's, 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 that's in my heart, <laughs> to my soul. All right. Uh, let's see. I think we've caught up with the Joneses. So yeah, let me go ahead and uh, do my startup and we'll get into some news. I feel like it's too early to drink, drink. So sadly, we're just, we're going to do the California route, if you know what I mean. And, you know, this and some water. Mm. All right. Our first story comes from ABC News. And really, I was, you know, doing my little workout before I, you know, started doing my research today. And I was hearing a story I've, I kind of got behind on the news. Uh, but they were talking about Sudan. And, you know, we've, you know, we I'm trying to keep up with that, you know, as best I can talk about it, you know, when I can. And, um, yeah, I just really had heard a story that was like said, OK, we, we got to get back to it, do a little bit of an update. So here we are. Uh, it's kind of a couple a quick bundle, if you will. But um, from ABC News, Sudan faces perfect storm as civil war sparks humanitarian crisis. Aid aid groups warn. A humanitarian perfect storm is brewing in Sudan as hunger looms, health systems collapse, and millions are displaced. With the the World Health Organization or WHO um, has warned last week in a briefing. Just over ten months since the start of the conflict between the Sudanese armed forces, um, and the, which is the SAF, and the rapid support forces. Uh, uh, par- paramilitary group, sorry, I'm stuttering, RSF, um, aid organizations say Sudan is being plunged into a humanitarian crisis of epic proportions. Uh, let's see here. Sudan is now one of the largest displacement uh, crises globally, with nearly 8 million people disp- uh, displaced due to the ongoing conflict. Peter Graf, the WHO's representative to Sudan, said in last week's briefing, about 25 million people in Sudan need humanitarian assistance, 18 million of whom are facing acute hunger, 5 million at emergency uh, levels of hunger. So, I mean, this is a conflict that, you know, we, we started covering around April, but it has started April 15th of 2023. Um, between the Rapid Support Forces, or the RSF and the SAF, 
after weeks of tensions linked to a plan for returning the country to civilian rule after the dissolution of Sudan's government um, has killed at least 12,000 people, according to the UN. Local groups, however, say the true toll is likely much higher. Um, so yeah, that's, that's obviously very unfortunate. It's a shame too, that the aid like, like is stressed so thin. Uh, I know, you know, we talk about Ukraine a lot, you know, we've been talking about the situation going on in, you know, Palestine and Gaza and the West Bank. And, you know, there's other crises as well, but you know, it's, it's a shame that this has been going on as, you know, too. And in all these situations, it always just seems so thin and so threadbare and that people are just not getting enough. Um, and what I really wanted to lead to is the secondary story, um, from the BBC news, um, and just trigger warning. Cause you know, this is a pretty hard title, but, um, you know, sexual assault, uh, child rape and ethnic killings exposed in Sudan, UN, a report by the UN's health or the UN's human rights office has laid bare her, uh, horrific violations being committed by both sides in the war in Sudan. The report covers the eight months after the conflict broke out last April and contains evidence from hundreds of people. It suggests thousands have been killed in ethnically motivated attacks in the Darfur region and includes allegations of children being raped. Satellite imagery shows the widespread use of heavy explosives in densely populated areas, killing large numbers of civilians. Obviously, that's something that's really fucked up, too, because you're in a situation where you were forced to leave because this conflict just, boom, broke out. There was so much shooting. There was so much gunfire. It was nonstop. People were dying. People were coming and potentially uh, abducting you, your one of your family members being held for ransom. You don't, don't know what's happening next. You got to get out of here. And now, like, you, you want to go back, but, like, it, it's still a hot zone. Not to mention, your whole shit could just be rigged to blow. You don't know. Um, and then let's see here. The report comes after video footage emerged this week of students being beheaded by men in uniform who later paraded the decapitated heads through the streets. The UN is calling for an end to the fighting and inclusive talks towards a civilian's government in Sudan. But honestly, I've not heard any fruit from any of those kind of talks or anything like that. So, I mean, if I do, I will definitely keep you posted. I just felt like it had been a really long time since I had talked about it on the podcast. And I heard that story and I said, okay, I'm going to bump this to the top. So, here we are. Okay, uh, we did that. Not that we're doing a palate cleanser or anything like that, but uh, from ABC News. U.S. imposes crushing sanctions on Russia two years after Ukraine invasion. The Biden administration on Friday announced more than 500 sanctions on Russia, its enablers, and its war machine as the world marks two years since Russia attacked Ukraine. This is the largest single tranche since the start of the Russian President Vladimir Putin's invasion, uh, administration officials said. Today, I am announcing more than 500 new sanctions against Russia for its ongoing war of conquest on Ukraine and for the death of Alesky Navalny, who was a courageous anti-corruption activist and Putin's fiercest opposition leader. President Joe Biden said in a statement released by the White House, uh, the sanctions will target individuals connected to Navalny's imprisonment as well as Russia's financial sector, defense industrial base, procurement networks, and sanctions in, in sanctions and evaders across multiple continents. They will ensure Putin pays an even steeper price for his aggression abroad and oppression at home. Um, adding, we are also imposing new export restrictions on nearly 100 entities for providing backdoor support for Russia's war machine, Biden continued. We are taking action to further reduce Russia's energy revenues, and I've directed my team to strengthen support for civil society, independent media, and those who fight for democracy around the world. 
Uh, I mean, all that shit sounds really nice, but I've said this before and I'll say this again. I really don't give a shit about these sanctions. They they are oftentimes annoying to me because it's us trying to, like, wrap the knuckles of other countries and other, you know, groups and peoples and saying, hey, stop what you're doing. You can't do business here now. Now, now act right. And it's like, dude, you're just going to keep doing this style of punishment. And then they're just going to keep getting more entrenched and wanting to do bad things and then finding more workarounds to to get their shit done because inevitably motherfuckers are going to find a way to eat they're going to find a way to arm themselves they're going to find a way to do all the essentials is what i'm saying so like trying to do this in a way of like saying hey we're like ethically punishing uh, you know these other you know countries these, these these dictators these tyrants these blah blah like this is just a terrible way of doing things i feel personally so when i when i hear us tout a new round of sanctions it it just puts me to fucking sleep and i just don't feel like it does anything um usually though it winds up affecting people in like the the middle class to lower class you know the poor because then yeah now your life is harder now because there's like economic tensions but overall the government's gonna get what they want the nation state is gonna get what they need you know like i don't know so there's that I, i wanted to add to uh since you know navalny is kind of you know the the crux of this conversation in a way you know because it all kind of culminates um you know with the war you know two-year anniversary obviously him you know Navalny being a a big opponent to Putin and all this kind of shit so it's all kind of colliding but um an ally of the late opposition leader Alexei Navalny said Friday um that Russian authorities have given his mother a deadline to agree to forego a public funeral or else they'll bury him on prison grounds. So, yeah, she went to, um, it's, uh, it's a, it's a Siberian prison. Um, but yeah, it was Arctic Wolf. I think that's the name of it. But essentially she went to the prison where Navalny died and, um, you know, she was like, you know, I want my son's body back. And they're like, we can't give him back to you yet. So, like, that was already an issue. And, you know, essentially they're like, okay, well, she's like, well, you know, let me sign the birth certificate or the death certificate, I'm sorry. And two days, you know, by two days I'm supposed to have this all done. Like, we should have this process going. And they're like, okay, let's make a deal. Like, if you just don't do any fuss, we'll take you to where he is. Like, we'll take you to where we're going to bury him. We'll show him to you. And then this will all be over and then we'll be cool or you're not going to get anything like you're going to have to you know do this the hard way so essentially she said no the people deserve to have a proper you know burial proper you know mourning for alexi and that's what i want obviously i'm paraphrasing wildly so you know um it, that's that's obviously a super sad part about this you know for you know all of you know navalny's family having to you know go through all of this but um you know, obviously condolences to them. And hopefully the, I, I do feel like that, you know, as a family, I know Navani's wife, I feel like they are trying to make the most of it and, you know, not let his message die. And, you know, that's good. So, you know, here's to that. Cheers to that. But yeah, um, let's go on. Let's go march on to the next thing. Uh, reload, if you will, um, from Reuters. Jury says NRA ex-chief LaPierre liable for mismanaging gun rights group. So we got a bit of a conclusion on the NRA fiasco, fiasco. Um, Former longtime National Rifle Association chief Wayne LaPierre mismanaged the gun rights group and cost it millions of dollars through wasteful spending to support a lavish lifestyle a jury found on Friday, recommending that he repay $4.35 million. In a civil corruption case brought by New York Attorney General Letitia Letitia James, the six-person jury in Manhattan also recommended that former NRA Treasurer and Chief Financial Officer Officer Wilson Phillips repay the group $2 million uh, for his own mismanagement. Scroll a little more. Another defendant, uh, NRA current secretary and general counsel John Frazier, did not harm the group financially, the jury found. 
In a 2020 lawsuit, James accused the NRA of letting top executives divert millions of dollars for luxuries, turning the group into Wayne's World, as LaPierre uh, enjoyed private jets, expensive trips, and Beverly Hills shopping spree. James also said the NRA ignored the need for board approval to waive conflict of interests and approve insider transactions. Um, so yeah, I mean, essentially, uh, LaPierre's defense is like, no, this isn't what you guys are making it out to be. Sure, we had some problems, but we actually were doing some course corrections. You guys should be giving us a pat on the back, actually. And not to mention, this is a witch hunt, okay? She's a Democrat. We obviously love guns. We're, we're God-loving Republicans, and, you know, we believe in our Second Amendment right to bear arms, brother, yee yee. And, uh, you know, clearly... You guys are trying to, you know, get us for these reasons. And it's like, no, we're saying that you guys are taking advantage of the members of this group. And the people at the very top are just kind of milking this whole thing. And there's certain situations where, you know, everyone winds up having to pay more dues because, oh, LaPierre is partying, hanging out with this producer, smoozing him, and they sign this, like, juicy little contract. And it's like, well, how are we going to pay for this? Well, you know, we'll ship that on down. We'll trigger that on down. Like good old Republicans, good old boys, if you will. So, you know, I personally think that this did become a racket, uh, you know, politics aside, all that kind of bullshit. I think at the end of the day, these guys at the top were not about gun rights anymore. They might hop on a podium and like give a spiel and do a screed and say, hey, no, like at the end of the day, this is about, you know, us protecting our rights to bear arms. But behind the scenes, they were just jet setting. They were just big chilling. And um, I think that's the same for, you know, the people who are just, you know, paying their dues and, you know, wanting to be a part of this group. You could argue that, I mean, if they are all cool with it, then who really cares who's really hurt and harmed here? But, I mean, legally, since this is a corporation founded in New York, they can say, hey, you guys were funded to be a charity. You aren't moving like a charity. So we had a right to look into this, and here's what we found. We found a lot of corruption. We found that you guys were, you know, a, a pretty much a whole ass racket. So, um, you know, I think justice was served here. Um, I don't know. I, we'll see if there's any, like, appeals or, you know, any more... Um, uh, to really say, I'm sure there is, but I'm just missing it. But, you know, when it pops up on the news, I'll, I'll be there to cover it. Uh, I'll read my highlighted portion, and then we'll move on to the last beat. The NRA, since 1871, has been a New York-registered nonprofit organization, meaning its assets must be used to advance charitable needs and serve members. Uh, and, I mean, yeah, you could argue that some of the members were definitely served. <laughs> nice old champagne and whatnot. Um, but, yeah. We, yeah, we can call that. On to the last beat. Uh, you know what that means. I'm going to take my break, and then we will close this on out um, with one more news story. Sadly, this is not a good one. So, you know, there's no bad puns or anything like that. We're just going to do our thing. All right. From ABC News. Two National Guardsmen dead after military helicopters. Helicopter. Sorry. Uh, two National Guardsmen dead after military helicopter crashes in Mississippi during routine training flight. <coughs> Excuse me. Two, two National Guardsmen <coughs> are dead after a military helicopter crashed in northwest Mississippi on Friday afternoon during a routine training flight, officials said. An AH-64 Apache crashed around 2 p.m. in a wooded area near Boonville in Prentiss County, according to the Mississippi National Guard. Both guardsmen on board the helicopter died, according to Mississippi Governor Tate Reeves. Mississippi will always be grateful to their service, and we will never forget them," he said in a statement on social media. Um, one social or one soldier in 
A Company, one 149 Aviation Regiment Unit, and the other was in D Company, two uh, 151 Lakota Medical Evalu- Evacuation Unit, the Mississippi National Guard said. The incident is under investigation and no further details are being released at this time, the Mississippi National Guard said. So there you have it. That is what we have there. Obviously, you know, condolences to the soldiers, lives lost, um, you know, the families. Uh, you know, we cover sadly a lot of these situations. Like I said before, I'll say again, helicopters are scary. Uh, flying is pretty scary, if you ask me. But hey, I know we got to do it. I know we got to get those birds in the air. So these things can happen. Just like, you know, hopping in a car or getting on your bus or just going outside for a little walk and, you know, getting poof. You just never know what could happen to you. Um, no, not to end on that bad note. I don't know. Um, but hey, that, that, that's life. Jesus Christ. Yeah, that, and that's also this episode. I'll, I'm going to have to wrap it up there. Um, if you'd like to help out and support the effort, you can. Patreon.com, so says Zan News. Uh, become a newsie today. I shout you out at the top of the month. Say your name, plug the project that you're on, thing you're doing if you'd like. Three ways to hit me up, news one at gmail.com. Feel free to um, follow me or the podcast on the socials. Or contact me there as well. Uh, you can leave a comment on the YouTube. You can leave a thumbs up on the YouTube. Um, also, you can subscribe to the YouTube. That really does mean a lot. It really helps out a lot. Um, sharing is always caring. Uh, I, I, I always peep that. I love that. You know, uh, I try not to be weird though. Like I feel like that's like narcissistic, but I definitely heart it from you know with my eyes. Anyway. Uh, so yeah, that, that's, that's it. Thank you so much for tuning in. Thank you so much for being a friend. And hopefully I see you soon for some more good news. I love you. Bye-bye. Mwah.